Thank you, Chairman, and to Ranking Member McGovern, and to those of you on the committee, Mr. Norman, that I have my back to apologize, but you can see that we are tight around the table. The fiscal year 2025 Defense Appropriation Act totals $833 billion, and that's slightly over President Biden's budget request. And I truly appreciate that this bill conforms to the Fiscal Responsibility Act. However, I do have concerns with this bill and how it will impact our military readiness and unit cohesion. Like the past generations who fought for the ideals espoused in our Constitution, we need to foster a climate in our military that appreciates and supports all Americans who take that oath to serve. Unfortunately, at this time, this bill does not reflect that sentiment. Fiscal year 2025 Department of Defense appropriation bill presented to us today repeats some of the same mistakes as the FY24 House bill proposal. Once again, this bill includes partisan social riders that were just rejected in the FY24 conference agreement. And the inclusion of those riders in the process last year led to several continuing resolutions that spanned over five months of this fiscal year. And our national security cannot afford to wait another five months as we previously did. Once again, this bill limits the ability of service personnel and their families to receive the reproductive health care they deserve. I would remind that my colleagues that women make up almost 20% of the military services. And approximately 800,000 women, service women, live in a state that has banned or limited access to reproductive health care. None of those women can choose where they serve, where they are stationed. I have an amendment that I submitted to the committee that would strike this writer, and I urge the Rules Committee to make it in order so that our service members and their families get the health care that they deserve. Once again, there are offensive provisions that disenfranchise lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender service members. Rather than making our military a welcoming, place, an inclusive place for all those who want to serve our country. Yet again, these provisions are included in the bill, and they needlessly attack diversity and inclusion efforts at the department. Our military is the only institution, the only institution in our country that most broadly reflects the American population. We know that the services have been facing recruiting challenges. But we did hear recently from the Army and the Navy this year that they're seeing improvements in the recruiting numbers, and I congratulate them for that. So why would we, with good conscience, want to include provisions that might dissuade any American, regardless of their background, from taking the oath of service, of offering to put their life on the line for all of us? Beyond the social policies, there's other elements in this bill that I cannot support. First, the bill continues to treat climate change as if it's not happening, and that it's not a national security threat. And we know for a fact that it is. Mm -hmm. We've seen the impact of severe weather events on installations year after year. Just look at Guam as a recent example. Over $50 billion in repairs will be needed for the installation of Guam, which were damaged by a typhoon last year. With all the military construction and funding going into Guam, the evidence of infrastructure vulnerability on that island is even more clear. Cutting climate programs hards resiliency, and we will pay for it as taxpayers on the back end. Second, the bill cuts funding for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. I recently, along with uh, Congresswoman Lee, met with President <laughs> Zelensky, and he expressed how grateful the Ukrainian people were that the United States had finally delivered on additional ammunition funding to help Ukraine repel Putin's illegal invasion. This bill should have included long-term assistance that Ukraine needs. And that funding has been in the bill. The long-term assistance has been in the bill since 2016. This funding signals that the West stands with them in their fight for their own self-determination. And it's assistance that will continue to enhance the Ukraine's military ability to work with NATO forces. Failure to continue this funding, which has long been standing, bipartisan initiatives support Ukraine, to cut it sends a terrible signal. And I believe it will only embolden Putin. And why in heaven's name would any of us want to give Putin any kind of advantage? 
And third, this bill limits the ability for our government to address disinformation. Our foreign embassies use social media to spread disinformation here at home in the United States. This bill deprives the department of their responsibility to set the facts straight. And this is dangerous and would have real national security implications here at home and abroad. Every member in this room knows what needs to happen for this bill to become law. The partisan writers need to come out so that the bill can get bipartisan support. And it was deeply unfortunate that we had to waste half of fiscal year 2024 to learn that lesson. But you have my commitment to work with the chair to once again find a bipartisan solution to make sure that our service members have what they need to do their job and return home safely and protect the greatest democracy on, on the planet. With that, I yield back.